Chapter One of the Terror: A Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lilith Branda. The Terror, by Arthur Machen. Chapter One: The Coming of the Terror. After two years, we are turning once more to the morning's news with a sense of appetite and glad expectation. There were thrills at the beginning of the war. The thrill of horror and of doom that seemed at once incredible and certain. This was when Namur fell and the German host swelled like a flood over the French fields and drew very near to the walls of Paris. And we felt the thrill of exultation when the good news came that the awful tide had been turned back that paris and the world were safe for a while at all events then for days we hoped for more news as good as this or better has von kluck been surrendered not to-day but perhaps it will be surrendered to-morrow but the days became weeks the weeks drew out to months the battle in the west seemed frozen now and again things were done that seemed hopeful with promise of events still better but neuve champelle and luz dwelled into disappointments as their tale was told fully the lies in the west remained for all practical purposes of victory immobile nothing seemed to happen there was nothing to read save the record of operations that were clearly trifling and insignificant people speculated as to the reason of this inaction the hopeful said that Joffre had a plan that he was nibbling. Others declared that we were short of munitions. Others again that the new levies were not yet ripe for battle. So the months went by, and almost two years of war had been completed before the motionless English line began to stir and quiver as if it awoke from a long sleep and began to roll onward, overwhelming the enemy. The secret of the long inaction of the British armies has been well kept. On the one hand, it was rigorously protected by the censorship, which severe, and sometimes severe to the point of absurdity, the captains and the depart, for instance, became in this particular matter ferocious. As soon as the real significance of that which was happening, or beginning to happen, was perceived by the authorities, an underlined circular was issued to the newspaper proprietor of great britain and ireland it warned each proprietor that he might impart the contents of this circular to one other person only such person being the responsible editor of his paper he was to keep the communication secret under the severest penalties the circular forbade any mention of certain events that had taken place that might take place it forbade any kind of allusion to these events or any hint of their existence, or of the possibility of their existence, not only in the press, but in any form whatever. The subject was not to be alluded to in conversation. It was not to be hinted at, however obscurely, in letters. The very existence of the circular, its subject apart, was to be a dead secret these measures were successful a wealthy newspaper proprietor of the north warmed a little at the end of the throwster's fist which was held as usual it will be remembered ventured to say to the man next to him how awful it would be wouldn't it if his words were repeated as proof one regrets to say that it was time for old arnold to pull himself together and he was fined a thousand pounds then there was the case of an obscure weekly paper published in the county town of an agricultural district in wales the myros observer we would call it was issued from a stationer's back premises and filled its four pages with accounts of local flower shows fancy fairs at vicarages reports of parish councils and rare bathing fatalities it also issued a visitor's list which has been known to contain six names this enlightened organ printed a paragraph which nobody noticed which was very like paragraphs that small country newspapers have long been in the habit of printing which could hardly give so much as a hint to any one to any one that is who was not fully instructed in the secret as a matter of fact 
this piece of intelligence got into the paper because the proprietor he was also the editor incautiously left the last processes of this particular issue to the staff he was the lord high everything else of the establishment and the star put in a bit of gossip he had heard in the market to fill up two inches on the back page but the result was that the mayor's observer ceased to appear owing to untoward circumstances as the proprietor said and he would say no more no more that is by way of explanation but a great deal more by way of execration of damned prime busybodies now a censorship that is sufficiently minute and utterly remorseless can do amazing things in the way of hiding what it wants to hide before the war one would have thought otherwise one would have said that censor or no censor the fact of the murder at x or the fact of the bank robbery at y would certainly become known if not through the press at all events through rumour and the passage of the news from mouth to mouth and this would be true of england three hundred years ago and of savage tribelands of to-day but we have grown of late such a preference for the printed word and such a reliance on it that the old faculty of disseminating news by a word of mouth has become atrophied forbid the press to mention the fact that jones hath been murdered and it is marvellous how few people will hear of it and of those who hear how few will credit the story that they have heard you meet a man in the train who remarks that he has been told something about a murder in southwark there is all the difference in the world between the impression you receive from such a chance communication and that given by half a dozen lines of print with name in strict and date and all the facts of the case people in trains repeat all sorts of tales many of them false newspapers do not print accounts of murders that have not been committed then another consideration that has made for secrecy i may have seemed to say that the old office of rumour no longer exists i shall be reminded of the strange legend of the russians and the mythology of the angels of mont but let me point out in the first place that both these absurdities depended on the papers for their wide dissemination if there had been no newspapers or magazines russians and angels would have made for the brief vague appearance of the most shadowy kind a few would have heard of them fewer still would have believed in them they would have been gossiped about for a bare week or two and so they would have vanished away and then again the very fact of these vain rumours and fantastic tales having been so widely believed for a time was fatal to the credit of any stray mutterings that may have got abroad people had been taken in twice they had seen how grave persons men of credit had preached and lectured about the shining forms that had saved the british army at mons and had testified the trains packed with grey-coated muscovites rushing through the land at dead of night and now there was a hint of something more amazing than either of the discredited legends but this time there was no word of confirmation to be found in daily paper or weekly review or parish magazine a sort of few that had either laughed or being serious went home and jotted down nooks for essays on wartime psychology collective delusions i followed neither of these courses for before the secret circular had been issued my curiosity had somehow been aroused by certain paragraphs concerning a fatal accident to well-known airmen the propeller of the airplane had been shattered apparently by collision with a flight of pigeons the blades had been broken and the machine had fallen like lead to the earth and soon after as in this account i heard of some very odd circumstances relating to an explosion in the great munition factory in the midlands i thought i saw the possibility of a connection between two very different events it has been pointed out to me by friends who have been good enough to read this record the certain phrases i have used may give the impression that i ascribe all the delays of the war on the western front to the extraordinary circumstances which occasioned the issue of the secret circular of course this is not the case there were many reasons for the immobility of our lines from october nineteen fourteen to july nineteen sixteen 
These causes have been evident enough and have been openly discussed and deplored, but behind them was something of infinitely greater moment. We lacked men, but men were pouring into the new army. We were short of shells, but when the shortage was proclaimed, the nation set itself to mend this matter with all its energy. We could undertake to supply the defects of our army both in men and munitions, if the new and incredible danger could be overcome. It has been overcome, rather, perhaps. It has ceased to exist, and the secret may now be told. I have said my attention was attracted by an account of the death of a well-known airman. I have not a habit of preserving cuttings, I am sorry to say, so that I cannot be precise as to the date of this event. To the best of my belief, it was either towards the end of May or the beginning of June 1915. The newspaper paragraph announcing the death of Flight Lieutenant Western Reynolds was brief enough, accidents and fatal accidents, to the men who are storming the air for us are, unfortunately, by no means so rare as to demand an elaborate notice. But the manner in which Western Reynolds met his death struck me as extraordinary, inasmuch as it revealed a new danger in the element that we have lately conquered. It was brought down, as I said, by a flight of birds, with pigeons, as appeared by what was found on the blood-stained and shattered blades of the propeller. An eyewitness of the accident, a fellow officer, described how Western Reynolds set out from the aerodrome on a fine afternoon, there being hardly any wind. He was going to France. He had made the journey to and fro half a dozen times or more, and felt perfectly secure and at ease. Westerns rose to a great height at once, and we could scarcely see the machine. I was turning to go when one of the fellows called out, I say, what's this? He pointed up, and we saw what looked like a black cloud coming from the south at a tremendous rate. I saw at once it wasn't a cloud. It came with a swirl and a rush quite different from any cloud I've ever seen. But for a second I couldn't make out exactly what it was. It altered its shape and turned into a great crescent and wheeled and veered about as if it was looking for something. The man who had called out had got his glasses and was staring for all he was worth. Then he shouted that it was a tremendous flight of birds, thousands of them. They went on wheeling and beating about high up in the air and we were watching them, thinking it was interesting but not supposing that they would make any difference to Wester, who was just about out of sight. His machine was just a stake. Then the two arms of the crescent drew in as quick as lightning, and these thousands of birds shot in a solid mass right up there across the sky and flew away somewhere about nor nor by west. Then Haney, the man with the glasses, called out, "'He's dumb!' I started running, and I went after him. We got a car, and as we were going along, Haney told me that he'd seen the machine drop dead, as if it came out of that cloud of birds. He thought then that they must have mucked up the propeller somehow. That turned out to be the case. We found the propeller blades all broken and covered with blood and pigeon feathers, and carcasses of the birds had got wedged in between the blades and were sticking to them. This was the story that a young airman told one evening in a small company. He did not speak in confidence, so I have no hesitation in reproducing what he said. Naturally, I did not take a verbatim note of his conversation, but I have something of a knack of remembering talk that interests me, and I think my reproduction is very near to the tale that I heard. And let it be noted that the flying man told his story without any sense or indication of a sense that the incredible, or all but the incredible, had happened. So far as he knew, he said, it was the first accident of the kind. Airmen in France had been bothered once or twice by birds. He thought they were eagles, flying viciously at them. But poor old Wester had been the first man to come up against a flight of some thousands of pigeons. And perhaps I shall be the next he added, but why look for trouble? Anyhow, I'm going to see Tudo tomorrow afternoon. Well, I heard the story, as one hears all the varied marvels and terrors of the air, as one heard some years ago of air pockets, strange gulfs or voids in the atmosphere, into which airmen fell with great peril. 
or as one heard of the experience of the airman who flew over the cumberland mountains in the burning summer of nineteen eleven and as he swam far above the heights was suddenly and vehemently blown upwards the hot air from the rock striking his plane as if it had been a blast from a furnace chimney we have just begun to navigate a strange region we must expect to encounter strange adventures strange perils and here a new chapter in the chronicles of these perils and adventures had been opened by the death of western reynolds no doubt invention and contrivance would presently hit on some way of countering the new danger it was i think about a week or ten days after the airman's death that my business called me to a northern town the name of which perhaps had better remain unknown my mission was to inquire into certain charges of extravagance which had been laid against the working people that is the munition workers of this especial town it was said that the men who used to earn two pounds ten shillings a week were now getting from seven to eight pounds that bits of girls were being paid two pounds instead of seven or eight shillings and that in consequence there was an orgy of foolish extravagance the girls i was told were eating chocolates at four five and six shillings a pound the women were ordering thirty pound pianos which they couldn't play and the men bought gold chains at ten and twenty guineas apiece i dived into the town in question and found as usual that there was a mixture of truth and exaggeration in the stories that i had heard gramophones for example they cannot be called in strictness necessaries but they were undoubtedly finding a ready sale even in the more expensive brands and i thought that there were a great many very spick and span perambulators to be seen on the pavement smart perambulators painted in tender shades of colour and expensively fitted and how can you be surprised if people will have a bit of a fling a worker said to me we are seeing money for the first time in our lives and it's bright and we work hard for it and we risk our lives to get it you've heard of explosion yonder he mentioned certain works on the outskirts of the town of course neither the name of the works nor of the town had been printed there had been a brief notice of explosion at munition works in the northern district many fatalities the working man told me about it and added some dreadful details they wouldn't let their folks see the bodies screwed them up in coffins as they found them in shop the gas had done it turned the faces black you mean nay they were all as if they had been bitten to pieces this was a strange gas i asked the man in the northern town all sorts of questions about the extraordinary explosion of which he had spoken to me but it had very little more to say as i have noted already secrets that may not be printed are often deeply kept last summer there were very few people outside high official circles who knew anything about the tanks of which we have all been talking lately though so these strange instruments of war were being exercised and tested in a park not far from london so the man who told me of the explosion in the munition factory was most likely genuine in his profession that he knew nothing more of the disaster I found out that he was a smelter employed at a furnace on the other side of the town to the ruined factory. He didn't know even what they had been making there. Some very dangerous high explosive, he supposed. His information was really nothing more than a bit of gruesome gossip, which he had heard probably at third or fourth or fifth hand. The horrible detail of faces, as if they had been bitten to pieces, had made his violent impression on him that was all i gave him up and took a tram to the district of the disaster a sort of industrial suburb five miles from the centre of the town when i asked for the factory i was told that it was no good my going to it as there was nobody there but i found it a raw and hideous shed with a ward yard about it and a shut gate i looked for signs of destruction but there was nothing the roof was quite undamaged, and again it struck me that this had been a strange accident. There had been an explosion of sufficient violence to kill work people in the building, but the building itself showed no wounds or scars. A man came out of the gate and locked it behind him. 
I began to ask him some sort of question or other. I began to open for a question with a terrible business here, they tell me, or some such phrase of convention. I got no farther. The man asked me if I saw a policeman walking down the street. I said I did, and I was given the choice of getting about my business forthwith or of being instantly given in charge as a spy. Thest better be gone and quick about it, was, I think, his final advice, and I took it. Well, I had come literally up against a brick wall. Thinking the problem over, I could only suppose that the smelter or his informant had twisted the phrases of the story. The smelter had said the dead man's faces were bitten to pieces. This might be an unconscious perversion of eaten away. That phrase might describe well enough the effect of strong acids, and for all I knew of the processes of munition-making, such acids might be used and might explode with horrible results in some perilous stage of their admixture. It was a day or two later that the accident of the airman, Western Reynolds, came into my mind. For one of those instants, which are far shorter than any measure of time, there flashed out the possibility of a link between the two disasters. But here was a wild impossibility, and I drove it away. And yet, I think that the thought, mad as it seemed, never left me. It was the secret light that at last guided me through a sombre grove of enigmas. It was about this time, so far as the date can be fixed, that a whole district, one might say a whole county, was visited by a series of extraordinary and terrible calamities, which were the more terrible inasmuch as they continued for some time to be inscrutable mysteries. It is, indeed, doubtful whether these awful events do not still remain mysteries to many of those concerned. For before the inhabitants of this part of the country had time to join one link of evidence to another, the secular was issued, and thenceforth no one knew how to distinguish undoubted facts from wild and extravagant surmise. The district in question is in the far west of Wales, I shall call it for convenience, Marion. In it there is one seaside town of some repute with holiday makers for five or six weeks in the summer, and dotted about the county there are three or four small old towns that seem drooping in a slow decay, sleepy and grey with age and forgetfulness. They remind me of what I have read of towns in the west of Ireland. Grass grows between the uneven stones of the pavements, the sides above the shop windows decline, Half the letters of these signs are missing. Here and there a house has been pulled down, or has been allowed to slide into ruin, and wild greenery springs up through the fallen stones, and there is silence in all the streets. And, it is to be noted, these are not places that were once magnificent. The Celts have never had the art of building, and so far as I can see, such towns as Towin and Marcel, Teveld and Meiros must have been always much as they are now. Clusters of poorish, mainly built houses, ill-kept and down at hill. And these few towns are thinly scattered over a wild country where north is divided from south by a wilder mountain range. One of these places is sixteen miles from any station. The others are doubtfully and deviously connected by single-line railways served by rare trains that pause and stagger and hesitate on their slow journey up mountain passes, or stop for half an hour or more at lonely sheds called stations, situated in the midst of desolate marshes. A few years ago, I travelled with an Irishman on one of these queer lines, and he looked to right and saw the bog with its yellow and blue grasses and stagnant pools, and he looked to left and saw a ragged hillside, set with grey stone walls. I can hardly believe, he said, that I'm not still in the wilds of Ireland. Here, then, one sees a wild and divided and scattered region, a land of outland hills and secret and hidden valleys, I know white farms on this coast which must be separate by two hours of hard, rough walking from any other habitation, which are invisible from any other house, and inland again, the farms are often ringed about by thick rows of ash planted by men of old days to shelter their roof trees from rude winds of the mountain and stormy winds of the sea. 
so that these places too are hidden away she be surmised only by the wood smoke that rises from the green surrounding leaves a londoner must see them to believe in them and even then he can scarcely credit their utter isolation such then in the main is merion and on this land in the early summer of last year terror descended a terror without shape such as no man there had ever known it began with the tale of a little child who wandered out into the lanes to pick flowers one sunny afternoon and never came back to the cottage on the hill End of chapter 1chapter two of the terror a mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by zach van stanley the terror by arthur mcken chapter two death in the village the child who was lost came from a lonely cottage that stands on the slope of a steep hillside called the alt or the height the land about it is wild and ragged here the growth of gorse and bracken here a marshy hollow of reeds and rushes marking the course of the stream from some hidden well here thickets of dense and tangled undergrowth the outposts of wood down through this broken and uneven ground a path leads to the lane at the bottom of the valley then the land rises again and swells up to the cliffs over the sea about a quarter of a mile away the little girl gertrude morgan asked her mother if she might go down to the lane and pick up the purple flowers these were orchids that grew there and her mother gave her leave telling her that she must be back by tea-time as there was apple tart for tea she never came back it was supposed that she must have crossed the road and gone to the cliff's edge possibly in order to pick the sea pinks that were then in full blossom she must have slipped they said and fallen into the sea two hundred feet below and it may be said at once that there was no doubt some truth in this conjecture though it stopped very short of the whole truth the child's body must have been carried out by the tide for it was never found the conjecture of a false step or of a fatal slide on the slippery turf that slopes down the rocks was accepted as the only explanation possible people thought the accident a strange one because as a rule the country children living by the cliffs and the sea became wary at an early age and gertrude morgan was almost ten years old still as the neighbors said that's how it must have happened and it's a great pity to be sure but this would not do when in a week's time a strong young laborer failed to come to his cottage after the day's work his body was found on the rock six or seven miles from the cliffs where the child was supposed to have fallen he was going home by a path that he had used every night of his life for eight or nine years when he used the dark of nights in perfect security knowing every inch of it the police asked if he drank but he was a teetotaler if he were subject to fits but he wasn't and he was not murdered for his wealth since agricultural laborers are not wealthy it was only possible again to talk of slippery turf and a false step but people began to be frightened then a woman was found with her neck broken at the bottom of a disused quarry near la fehangel in the middle of the country the false step theory was eliminated here for the quarry was guarded with a natural hedge of gorse bushes one would have to struggle to fight through sharp thorns to destruction in such a place as this and indeed the gorse bushes were broken as if some one had rushed furiously through them just above the place where the woman's body was found and this was strange there was a dead sheep lying beside her in the pit as if the woman and the sheep together had been chased over the brim of the quarry but chased by whom or by what and then there was a new form of terror this was in the region of the marshes under the mountain 
a man and his son a lad fourteen or fifteen set out early one morning to work and never reached the farm where they were bound their way skirted the marsh but it was broad firm and well metalled and it had been raised about two feet over the bog but when search was made in the evening of the same day phillips and his son were found dead in the marsh covered with black slime and pondweed and they lay some ten yards from the path which it would seem they must have left deliberately it was useless of course to look for tracks in the black ooze for if one threw a big stone into it a few seconds removed all marks of the disturbance the men who found the two bodies beat about the verges and purlieus of the marsh in hope of finding some trace of the murderers they went to and fro over the rising ground where the black cattle were grazing they searched the alder thickets by the brook but they discovered nothing most horrible of all these horrors perhaps was the affair of the highway a lonely and unfrequented by-road that winds for many miles on a high and lonely land here a mile from any other dwelling stands a cottage on the edge of a dark wood it was inhabited by a labourer named williams his wife and their three children one hot summer's evening a man who had been doing a day's gardening at the rectory three or four miles away passed the cottage and stopped for a few minutes to chat with williams the labourer who was pottering about his garden while the children were playing on the path by the door the two talked of their neighbours and of the potatoes till mrs williams appeared at the doorway and said supper was ready and williams turned to go into the house this was about eight o'clock and in the ordinary course the family would have their supper and be in bed by nine or by half-past nine at the latest at ten o'clock that night the local doctor was driving home along the highway his horse shied violently and then stopped dead just opposite the gate to the cottage the doctor got down frightened at what he saw and there on the roadway lay williams his wife and the three children stone dead all of them their skulls were battered in as if by some heavy iron instrument their faces were beaten to a pulp End of chapter 2 Recording by Zach Van Stanley Chapter 3 of The Terror, A Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski the Terror by Arthur Machen Chapter 3 The Doctor's Theory It is not easy to make any picture of the horror that lay dark on the hearts of the peoples of Marion. It was no longer possible to believe or to pretend to believe that these men and women and children had met their deaths through strange accidents. The little girl and the young laborer might have slipped and fallen over the cliffs, but the woman who lay dead with the dead sheep at the bottom of the quarry, the two men who had been lured into the ooze of the marsh, the family who were found murdered on the highway before their own cottage door, in these cases there could be no room for the supposition of accident. It seemed as if it were impossible to frame any conjecture or outline of conjecture that would account for these hideous and as it seemed utterly purposeless crimes for a time people said that there must be a madman at large a sort of country variant of jack the ripper some horrible pervert who was possessed by the passion of death who prowled darkling about that lonely land hiding in woods and in wild places always watching and seeking for the victims of his desire. Indeed, Dr. Lewis, who found poor Williams, his wife and children, miserably slaughtered on the highway, was convinced at first that the presence of a concealed madman in the countryside offered the only possible solution to the difficulty. I felt sure, he said to me afterwards, that the Williams had been killed by a homicidal maniac. It was the nature of the poor creature's injuries that convinced me 
that this was the case. Some years ago, 37 or 38 years ago, as a matter of fact, I had something to do with a case which on the face of it had a strong likeness to the highway murder. At that time, I had practice at Usk, in Monmouthshire. A whole family living in a cottage by the roadside were murdered one evening. It was called, I think, the Langibi murder. The cottage was near the village of that name. The murderer was caught in Newport. He was a Spanish sailor named Garcia, and it appeared that he had killed father, mother, and the three children for the sake of the brass works of an old Dutch clock which were found on him when he was arrested. Garcia had been serving a month's imprisonment at Usk jail for some small theft, and on his release he set out to walk to Newport, nine or ten miles away, no doubt to get another ship. He passed the cottage and saw the man working in his garden. Garcia stabbed him with his sailor's knife. The wife rushed out. He stabbed her. Then he went into the cottage and stabbed the three children, tried to set the place on fire, and made off with the clockworks. That looked like the deed of a madman, but Garcia wasn't mad. They hanged him, I may say. He was merely a man of a very low type, a degenerate who hadn't the slightest value for human life. I am not sure, but I think he came from one of the Spanish islands, where the people are said to be degenerates, very likely from too much interbreeding. But my point is that Garcia stabbed to kill, and did kill, with one blow in each case. There was no senseless hacking and slashing. Now those poor people on the highway had their heads smashed to pieces by what must have been a storm of blows. Any one of them would have been fatal. But the murderer must have gone on raining blows with his iron hammer on people who were already stone dead. And that sort of thing is the work of a madman, and nothing but a madman. That's how I argue the matter out to myself, just after the event. I was utterly wrong, monstrously wrong. But who could have suspected the truth? Thus Dr. Lewis, and I quote him, or the substance of him, as representative of most of the educated opinion of the district at the beginnings of the terror. People seized on this theory largely because it offered at least the comfort of an explanation. And any explanation, even the poorest, is better than an intolerable and terrible mystery. Besides, Dr. Lewis's theory was plausible. It explained the lack of purpose that seemed to characterize the murders. And yet, there were difficulties even from the first. It was hardly possible that a strange madman should be able to keep hidden in a countryside where any stranger is instantly noted and noticed. Sooner or later he would be seen as he prowled along the lanes or across the wild places. Indeed, a drunken, cheerful, and altogether harmless tramp was arrested by a farmer and his man in the fact and act of sleeping off beer under a hedge, but the vagrant was able to prove complete and undoubted alibis and was soon allowed to go on his wandering way. Then another theory, or rather a variant of Dr. Lewis's theory, was started. This was to the effect that the person responsible for the outrages was indeed a madman, but a madman only at intervals. It was one of the members of the Porth Club, a certain Mr. Remnant, who was supposed to have originated this more subtle explanation. Mr. Remnant was a middle-aged man who, having nothing particular to do, read a great many books by way of conquering the hours. He talked to the club, doctors, retired colonels, parsons, lawyers, about personality quoted various psychological textbooks in support of his contention that personality was sometimes fluid and unstable, went back to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as good evidence of this proposition, and laid stress on Dr. Jekyll's speculation that the human soul, so far from being one and indivisible, might possibly turn out to be a mere polity a state in which dwelt many strange and incongruous citizens, whose characters 
were not merely unknown, but altogether unsurmised by that form of consciousness which so rashly assumed that it was not only the President of the Republic, but also its sole citizen. The long and the short of it is, Mr. Remnant concluded, that any one of us may be the murderer, though he hasn't the faintest notion of the fact. Take Llewellyn there. Mr. Payne Llewellyn was an elderly lawyer, a rural Tulkinghorn. He was the hereditary solicitor to the Morgans of Pentwyn. This does not sound anything tremendous to the Saxons of London, but the style is far more than noble to the Celts of West Wales. It is immemorial. Tilo Sant was of the collaterals of the first known chief of the race, and Mr. Payne Llewellyn did his best to look like the legal adviser of this ancient house. He was weighty. He was cautious. He was sound. He was secure. I have compared him to Mr. Tulkinghorn of Lincoln's Inn Fields, but Mr. Llewellyn would most certainly never have dreamed of employing his leisure in peering into the cupboards where the family skeletons were hidden. Supposing such cupboards to have existed, Mr. Payne Llewellyn would have risked large out-of-pocket expenses to furnish them with double, triple, impregnable locks. He was a new man, an advina, certainly, for he was partly of the conquest, being descended on one side from Sir Payne Turbeville, but he meant to stand by the old stock. "'Take Llewellyn now,' said Mr. Remnant. "'Look here, Llewellyn. Can you produce evidence to show where you were on the night those people were murdered on the highway? I thought not.' Mr. Llewellyn, an elderly man, as I have said, hesitated before speaking. "'I thought not,' Remnant went on. "'Now I say that it is perfectly possible that Llewellyn may be dealing death throughout Marion.' although in his present personality he may not have the faintest suspicion that there is another Llewellyn within him, a Llewellyn who follows murder as a fine art. Mr. Payne Llewellyn did not at all relish Mr. Remnant's suggestion that he might well be a secret murderer, ravening for blood, remorseless as a wild beast. He thought the phrase about his following murder as a fine art was both nonsensical and in the worst taste. And his opinion was not changed when Remnant pointed out that it was used by De Quincey in the title of one of his most famous essays. "'If you had allowed me to speak,' he said with some coldness of manner, "'I would have told you that on Tuesday last, the night on which those unfortunate people were murdered on the highway, I was staying at the Angel Hotel, Cardiff.' I had business in Cardiff, and I was detained till Wednesday afternoon. Having given this satisfactory alibi, Mr. Payne Llewellyn left the club, and did not go near it for the rest of the week. Remnant explained to those who stayed in the smoking-room that, of course, he had merely used Mr. Llewellyn as a concrete example of his theory, which, he persisted, had the support of a considerable body of evidence. There are several cases of double personality on record, he declared, and I say again that it is quite possible that these murders may have been committed by one of us in his secondary personality. Why, I may be the murderer in my Remnant B state, though Remnant A knows nothing whatever about it, and is perfectly convinced that he could not kill a fowl, much less a whole family. Isn't it so, Lewis? Dr. Lewis said it was so, in theory, but he thought not, in fact. Most of the cases of double or multiple personalities that have been investigated, he said, have been in connection with the very dubious experiments of hypnotism, or the still more dubious experiments of spiritualism. All that sort of thing, in my opinion, is like tinkering with the works of a clock. Amateur tinkering, I mean. You fumble about with the wheels and cogs and bits of mechanism that you don't really know anything about, and then you find your clock going backwards, or striking 2.40 at tea-time. And I believe it's just the same thing with these psychical research experiments. The secondary personality is very likely the result of the tinkering and fumbling with a very delicate apparatus that we know nothing about. 
Mind, I can't say that it's impossible for one of us to be the highway murderer in this B state, as Remnant puts it, but I think it's extremely improbable. Probability is the guide of life, you know, Remnant, said Dr. Lewis, smiling at that gentleman as if to say that he had also done a little reading in his day. And it follows, therefore, that improbability is also the guide of life. When you get a very high degree of probability, that is, you are justified in taking it as a certainty, and on the other hand, if a supposition is highly improbable, you are justified in treating it as an impossible one, that is, in 999 cases out of a thousand. How about the thousandth case, said Remnant, supposing these extraordinary crimes constitute the thousandth case? The doctor smiled and shrugged his shoulders, being tired of the subject. But for some little time, highly respectable members of Porth society would look suspiciously at one another, wondering whether, after all, there mightn't be something in it. However, both Mr. Remnant's somewhat crazy theory and Dr. Lewis's plausible theory became untenable when two more victims of an awful and mysterious death were offered up in sacrifice. For a man was found dead in the Lanvihanga quarry, where the woman had been discovered. And on the same day, a girl of fifteen was found broken on the jagged rocks under the cliffs near Porth. Now it appeared that these two deaths must have occurred at about the same time, within an hour of one another, certainly, and the distance between the quarry and the cliffs by Black Rock is certainly twenty miles. A motor could do it, one man said. But it was pointed out that there was no high road between the two places. Indeed, it might be said that there was no road at all between them. There was a network of deep, narrow, and tortuous lands that wandered into one another at all manner of queer angles for, say, seventeen miles. This in the middle, as it were, between Black Rock and the quarry at Lanvehangel. But to get to the high road at the cliffs, one had to take the path that went through two miles of fields, and the quarry lay a mile away from the nearest by-road in the midst of gorse and bracken and broken land. And finally there was no track of motor-car or motor-bicycle in the lanes which must have been followed to pass from one place to the other. "'What about an airplane, then?' said the man of the motor-car theory. Well, there was certainly an aerodrome not far from one of the two places of death, but somehow nobody believed that the Flying Corps harbored a homicidal maniac. It seemed clear, therefore, that there must be more than one person concerned in the terror of Marion, and Dr. Lewis himself abandoned his own theory. As I said to Remnant at the club, he remarked, improbability is the guide of life. I can't believe that there are a pack of madmen or even two madmen at large in the country. I give it up. And now a fresh circumstance or set of circumstances became manifest to confound judgment and to awaken new and wild surmises. For at about this time people realized that none of the dreadful events that were happening all about them was so much as mentioned in the press. I have already spoken of the fate of the Myros Observer, this paper was suppressed by the authorities because it had inserted a brief paragraph about some person who had been found dead under mysterious circumstances. I think that paragraph referred to the first death of Lanfehangel's quarry. Thenceforth, horror followed on horror, but no word was printed in any of the local journals. The curious went to the newspaper offices. There were two left in the county but found nothing save her firm refusal to discuss the matter. And the card of papers were drawn and found blank. And the London press was apparently ignorant of the fact that crimes that had no parallel were terrorizing a whole countryside. Everybody wondered what could have happened. What was happening? And then it was whispered that the coroner would allow no inquiry to be made as to these deaths of darkness. In consequence of instructions received from the Home Office, 
one coroner was understood to have said, I have to tell the jury that their business will be to hear the medical evidence and to bring in a verdict immediately in accordance with that evidence. I shall disallow all questions. One jury protested. The foreman refused to bring in any verdict at all. Very good, said the coroner. Then I beg to inform you, Mr. Foreman and gentlemen of the jury, that under the Defense of the Realm Act, I have power to supersede your functions, and to enter a verdict according to the evidence which has been laid before the court, as if it had been the verdict of you all. The foreman and jury collapsed and accepted what they could not avoid, but the rumors that got abroad of all this added to the known fact that the terror was ignored in the press, no doubt by official command, increased the panic that was now arising and gave it a new direction. Clearly, people reasoned, these government restrictions and prohibitions could only refer to the war, to some great danger in connection with the war. And that being so, it followed that the outrages which must be kept so secret were the work of the enemy, that is, of concealed German agents. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of The Terror A Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. The Terror by Arthur Machen. Chapter Four The Spread of the Terror. It is time, I think, for me to make one point clear. I began this history with certain references to an extraordinary accident to an airman whose machine fell to the ground after collision with a huge flock of pigeons, and then to an explosion in a northern munitions factory, an explosion, as I noted, of a very singular kind. Then I deserted the neighborhood of London and the northern district, and dwelt on a mysterious and terrible series of events which occurred in the summer of 1915 in a Welsh county, which I have named, for convenience, Marion. Well, let it be understood at once that all this detail that I have given about the occurrences in Marion does not imply that the county in the far west was alone or especially afflicted by the terror that was over the land. They tell me that in the villages about Dartmoor, the stout Devonshire hearts sank as men's hearts used to sink in the time of plague and pestilence. There was horror, too, about the Norfolk broads, and far up by Perth no one would venture on the path that leads by Scone to the wooded heights above the Tay. And in the industrial districts I met a man by chance one day in an odd London corner who spoke with horror of what a friend had told him. Ask no questions, Ned, he says to me, but I tell you, I was in Barnington the other day, and I met a pal who'd seen three hundred coffins going out of a works not far from there, and then the ship that hovered outside the mouth of the Thames with all sails set, and beat to and fro in the wind and never answered any hail, and showed no light. The forts shot at her and brought down one of the masts, but she went suddenly about with a change of wind under what sail still stood, and then veered down channel, and drove ashore at last on the sandbanks and pine woods of Arcachon, and not a man alive on her, but only rattling heaps of bones. That last voyage of the Semiramis would be something horribly worth telling, but I only heard it at a distance as a yarn, and only believed it because it squared with other things that I knew for certain. This, then, is my point. I have written of the terror as it fell on Marion, simply because I have had opportunities of getting close there to what really happened. Third or fourth or fifth hand in the other places, but round about Porth and Merthyr Tegveth, I have spoken with people who have seen the tracks of the terror with their own eyes. Well, I have said that the people of that far western county realized not only that death was abroad in their quiet lanes and on their peaceful hills, but that for some reason it was to be kept all secret. 
Newspapers might not print any news of it. The very juries summoned to investigate it were allowed to investigate nothing, and so they concluded that this veil of secrecy must somehow be connected with the war, and from this position it was not a long way to a further inference that the murderers of innocent men and women and children were either Germans or agents of Germany. It would be just like the Huns, everybody agreed, to think out such a devilish scheme as this, and they always thought out their schemes beforehand. They hoped to seize Paris in a few weeks, but when they were beaten on the Marne, they had their trenches on the Asne ready to fall back on. It had all been prepared years before the war, and so, no doubt, they had devised this terrible plan against England in case they could not beat us in open fight. There were people ready, very likely all over the country, who were prepared to murder and destroy everywhere as soon as they got the word. In this way, the Germans intended to sow terror throughout England and fill our hearts with panic and dismay, hoping so to weaken their enemy at home, that he would lose all heart over the war abroad. It was the Zeppelin notion, in another form. They were committing these horrible and mysterious outrages, thinking that we should be frightened out of our wits. It all seemed plausible enough. Germany had by this time perpetrated so many horrors, and had so excelled in devilish ingenuities, that no abomination seemed too abominable to be probable, or too ingeniously wicked to be beyond the tortuous malice of the Hun. But then came the questions as to who the agents of this terrible design were, as to where they lived, as to how they contrived to move unseen from field to field, from lane to lane. All sorts of fantastic attempts were made to answer these questions, but it was felt that they remained unanswered. Some suggested that the murderers landed from submarines, or flew from hiding places on the west coast of Ireland, coming and going by night but there were seen to be flagrant impossibilities in both these suggestions. Everybody agreed that the evil work was no doubt the work of Germany, but nobody could begin to guess how it was done. Somebody at the club asked Remnant for his theory. My theory, said that ingenious person, is that human progress is simply a long march from one inconceivable to another. Look at that airship of ours that came over Porth yesterday. Ten years ago, that would have been an inconceivable sight. Take the steam engine. Stake printing. Take the theory of gravitation. They were all inconceivable till somebody thought of them. So it is, no doubt, with this infernal dodgery that we're talking about. The Huns have found it out, and we haven't. And there you are. We can't conceive how these poor people have been murdered, because the method's inconceivable to us. The club listened with some awe to this high argument. After Remnant had gone, one member said, "'Wonderful man, that!' "'Yes,' said Dr. Lewis. He was asked whether he knew something, and his reply really amounted to, "'No, I don't. But I have never heard it better put.' It was, I suppose, at about this time when the people were puzzling their heads as to the secret methods used by the Germans or their agents to accomplish their crimes that a very singular circumstance became known to a few of the Porth people. It related to the murder of the Williams family, on the highway in front of their cottage door. I do not know that I have made it plain that the old Roman road, called the highway, follows the course of a long steep hill that goes steadily westward, till it slants down and droops towards the sea. On either side of the road the ground falls away, here into deep shadowy woods, here to high pastures, now and again into a field of corn, but for the most part into the wild and broken land that is characteristic of our foam. The fields are long and narrow, stretching up the steep hillside. They fall into sudden dips and hollows, a well springs up in the midst of one, and a grove of ash and thorn bends over it, shading it, and beneath it the ground is thick with reeds and rushes and then may come on either side of such a field territories glistening with the deep growth of bracken and rough with gorse and rugged with thickets of blackthorn green lichen hanging strangely from the branches such are the lands on either side of the highway now on the lower slopes of it beneath the williams cottage some three or four fields down the hill 
there is a military camp. The place has been used as a camp for many years, and lately the site has been extended and huts have been erected. But a considerable number of the men were under canvas here in the summer of 1915. On the night of the highway murder, this camp, as it appeared afterwards, was the scene of the extraordinary panic of the horses. A good many men in the camp were asleep in their tents soon after 9.30, when the last post was sounded. They woke up in panic. There was a thundering sound on the steep hillside above them, and down upon the tents came half a dozen horses, mad with fright, trampling the canvas, trampling the men, bruising dozens of them and killing, too. Everything was in wild confusion, men groaning and screaming in the darkness, struggling with the canvas and the twisted ropes, shouting out, some of them, raw lads enough, that the Germans had landed, others wiping the blood from their eyes, a few roused suddenly from heavy sleep, hitting out at one another, officers coming up at the double, roaring out orders to the sergeants, a party of soldiers who were just returning to camp from the village, seized with fright at what they could scarcely see or distinguish, at the wildness of the shouting and cursing and groaning that they could not understand, bolting out of the camp again and racing for their lives back to the village, everything in the maddest confusion of wild disorder. Some of the men had seen the horses galloping down the hill as if terror itself was driving them. They scattered off into the darkness, and somehow or another found their way back in the night of to their pasture above the camp. They were grazing there peacefully in the morning, and the only sign of the panic of the night before was the mud they had scattered all over themselves as they pelted through a patch of wet ground. The farmers said they were as quiet a lot as any in Marion. He could make nothing of it. Indeed, he said, I believe they must have seen the devil himself to be in such a fright as that, save the people. Now all this was kept as quiet as might be at the time when it happened. It became known to the men of the Porth Club in the days when they were discussing the difficult question of the German outrages, as the murders were commonly called. And this wild stampede of the farm horses was held by some to be evidence of the extraordinary and unheard of character of the dreadful agency that was at work. One of the members of the club had been told by an officer who was in the camp at the time of the panic that the horses that came charging down were in a perfect fury of fright, that he had never seen horses in such a state, and so there was endless speculation as to the nature of the sight or the sound that had driven half a dozen quiet beasts into raging madness. Then in the middle of this talk, two or three other incidences, quite as odd and incomprehensible came to be known, born on chance trickles of gossip that came into the towns from outland farms, or were carried by cottagers tramping into Porth on market day with a fowl or two and eggs and garden stuff, scraps and fragments of talk gathered by servants from the country folk and repeated to their mistresses. And in such ways it came out that up at Plas Noed, there had been a terrible business over swarming the bees. They had turned as wild as wasps, and much more savage. They had come about the people who were taking the swarms like a cloud. They settled on one man's face, so that you could not see the flesh for the bees crawling all over it. And they had stung him so badly that the doctor did not know whether he would get over it. And they had chased a girl who had come out to see the swarming, and settled on her and stung her to death. Then they had gone off to a break below the farm and got into a hollow tree there, and it was not safe to go near it, for they would come out at you by day or by night. And much the same thing had happened, it seemed, at three or four farms and cottages where bees were kept, and there were stories, hardly so clear or so credible, of sheepdogs, mild and trusted beasts, turning as savage as wolves and injuring the farm boys in a horrible manner. In one case, it was said, with fatal results. It was certainly true that old Mrs. Owen's favorite Brahma Dorking cock had gone mad. She came into Porth one Saturday morning with her face and her neck all bound up and plastered. She had gone out to her bit of a field to feed the poultry the night before, and the bird had flown at her and attacked her most savagely, 
inflicting some very nasty wounds before she could beat it off. "'There was a stay candy, lucky for me,' she said, "'and I did beat him and beat him till the life was out of him. "'But what has come to the world, whatever?' Now Remnant, the man of theories, was also a man of extreme leisure. It was understood that he had succeeded to ample means when he was quite a young man, and after tasting the savours of the law, as it were, for half a dozen terms at the board of the Middle Temple, he had decided that it would be senseless to bother himself with passing examinations for a profession which he had not the faintest intention of practising. So he turned a deaf ear to the call of manger ringing through the temple courts and set himself out to potter amiably through the world. He had pottered all over Europe, he had looked at Africa, and had even put his head in a door of the east on a trip which included the Greek Isles and Constantinople. Now getting into the middle fifties, he had settled at Porth for the sake, as he said, of the Gulf Stream and the fuchsia hedges and pottered over his books and his theories and the local gossip. He was no more brutal than the general public, which revels in the details of mysterious crime, but it must be said that the terror, black though it was, was a boon to him. He peered and investigated and poked about with the relish of a man whose life a new zest has been added. He listened attentively to the strange tales of bees and dogs and poultry that came into Porth with the country baskets of butter, rabbits, and green peas, and he evolved at last a most extraordinary theory. Full of this discovery, as he thought it, he went one night to see Dr. Lewis and take his view of the matter. "'I want to talk to you,' said Remnant to the doctor, "'about what I have called provisionally the Z Ray. End of chapter four. Chapter five of The Terror A Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. The Terror. By Arthur Machen. Chapter 5 The Incident of the Unknown Tree. Dr. Lewis, smiling indulgently and quite prepared for some monstrous piece of theorizing, led Remnant into the room that overlooked the terraced garden in the sea. The doctor's house, though it was only ten minutes' walk from the center of the town, seemed remote from all other habitations. The drive to it from the road came through a deep grove of trees and a dense shrubbery. Trees were about the house on either side, mingling with neighboring groves, and below the garden fell down, terrace by green terrace, to wild growth, a twisted path amongst red rocks, and at last to the yellow sand of a little cove. The room to which the doctor took Remnant looked over these terraces and across the water to the dim boundaries of the bay. It had French windows that were thrown wide open, and the two men sat in the soft light of the lamp. This was before the days of severe lighting regulations in the far west, and enjoyed the sweet odors and the sweet vision of the summer evening. Then Remnant began. I suppose, Lewis, You've heard these extraordinary stories of bees and dogs and things that have been going about lately. Certainly I've heard them. I was called in at Plas Newid and treated Thomas Trevor, who's only just out of danger, by the way. I certified for the poor child, Mary Trevor. She was dying when I got to the place. There was no doubt she was stung to death by bees, and I believe there were other very similar cases at Lantarnum and Morwen. None fatal, I think. What about them? Well, then there are the stories of good-tempered old sheepdogs turning wicked and savaging children. Quite so. I haven't seen any of these cases professionally, but I believe the stories are accurate enough. And the old woman assaulted by her own poultry? That's perfectly true. 
her daughter put some stuff of their own concoction on her face and neck, and then she came to me. The wounds seemed going all right, so I told her to continue the treatment, whatever it might be. "'Very good,' said Mr. Remnant. He spoke now, with an italic impressiveness. "'Don't you see the link between all this and the horrible things that have been happening about here for the last month?' Lewis stared at Remnant in amazement. He lifted his red eyebrows and lowered them in a kind of scowl. His speech showed traces of his native accent. "'Great burning!' he exclaimed. "'What on earth are you getting at now? It is madness! Do you mean to tell me that you think there is some connection between a swarm or two of bees that have turned nasty, a cross dog, and a wicked old barn door cock, and these poor people that have been pitched over the cliffs and hammered to death on the road? There is no sense in it, you know.' "'I am strongly inclined to believe that there is a great deal of sense in it,' replied Remnant, with extreme calmness. "'Look here, Lewis. I saw you grinning the other day at the club when I was telling the fellows that, in my opinion, all these outrages had been committed certainly by the Germans, but by some method of which we have no conception. But what I meant to say when I talked about inconceivables was just this, that the Williams and the rest of them have been killed in some way that's not in theory at all. Not in our theory, at all events. Some way we've not contemplated, not thought of for an instant. Do you see my point? Well, in a sort of way. You mean there's an absolute originality in the method? I suppose that is so, but what next? Remnant seemed to hesitate, partly from a sense of the portentous nature of what he was about to say, partly from a sort of half-unwillingness to part with so profound a secret. "'Well,' he said, "'you will allow that we have two sets of phenomena of a very extraordinary kind occurring at the same time. Don't you think that it's only reasonable to connect the two sets with one another?' So the philosopher of Tenderden Steeple and the Goodwin Sands thought, certainly, said Lewis. But what is the connection? Those poor folks on the highway weren't stung by bees or worried by a dog. And horses don't throw people over cliffs or stifle them in marshes. No, I never meant to suggest anything so absurd. It is evident to me that in all these cases of animals turning suddenly savage, the cause has been terror, panic, fear. The horses that went charging into the camp were mad with fright, we know. And I say that in the other instances we have been discussing the cause was the same. The creatures were exposed to an infection of fear, and a frightened beast or bird or insect uses its weapons, whatever they may be. If, for example, there had been anybody with those horses when they took their panic, they would have lashed out at him with their heels. Yes, I dare say that that is so. Well? Well, my belief is that the Germans have made an extraordinary discovery. I have called it the Z-ray. You know that the ether is merely an hypothesis. We have to suppose that it's there to account for the passage of the Marconi current from one place to another. Now suppose that there is a psychic ether, as well as a material ether. Suppose that it is possible to direct irresistible impulses across this medium. Suppose that these impulses are towards murder or suicide. Then I think you have an explanation of the terrible series of events that have been happening in Marion for the last few weeks. And it is quite clear to my mind that the horses and the other creatures have been exposed to this Z-ray, and that it has produced on them the effect of terror, with ferocity as the result of terror. Now what do you say to that? Telepathy, you know, is well established. So is hypnotic suggestion. You have only to look in the Encyclopedia Britannica to see that, and suggestion is so strong in some cases as to be an irresistible imperative. 
Now, don't you feel that putting telepathy and suggestion together, as it were, you have more than the elements of what I call the Z-ray? I feel myself that I have more to go on in making my hypotheses than the inventor of the steam engine had in making his hypotheses when he saw the lid of the kettle bobbing up and down. What do you say? Dr. Lewis made no answer. He was watching the growth of a new, unknown tree in his garden. The doctor made no answer to Remnant's question. For one thing, Remnant was profuse in his eloquence. He had been rigidly condensed in his history. And Lewis was tired of the sound of his voice. For another thing, he found the Z-ray theory almost too extravagant to be bearable, wild enough to tear patience to tatters, and then, as the tedious argument continued, Lewis became conscious that there was something strange about the night. It was a dark summer night. The moon was old and faint, above the dragon's head across the bay, and the air was very still. It was so still that Lewis had noted that not a leaf stirred on the very tip of a high tree that stood out against the sky, and yet he knew that he was listening to some sound that he could not determine or define. It was not the wind in the leaves. It was not the gentle wash of the water of the sea against the rocks. That latter sound he could distinguish quite easily. But there was something else. It was scarcely a sound. It was as if the air itself trembled and fluttered, as the air trembles in a church when they open the great pedal pipes of the organ. The doctor listened intently. It was not an illusion. The sound was not in his own head, as he had suspected for a moment. But for the life of him, he could not make out whence it came or what it was. He gazed down into the night over the terraces of his garden, now sweet with the scent of the flowers of the night, tried to peer over the treetops across the sea toward the dragon's head. It struck him suddenly that this strange fluttering vibration of the air might be the noise of a distant aeroplane or airship. There was not the usual droning hum, but this sound might be caused by a new type of engine. A new type of engine? Possibly it was an enemy airship. Their range, it had been said, was getting longer and Lewis was just going to call Remnant's attention to the sound, to its possible cause, and to the possible danger that might be hovering over them, when he saw something that caught his breath and his heart with wild amazement and a touch of terror. He had been staring upward into the sky and about to speak to Remnant. He had let his eyes drop for an instant. He looked down towards the trees in the garden and saw with utter astonishment that one had changed its shape in the few hours that had passed since the setting of the sun. There was a thick grove of ilexes bordering the lowest terrace, and above them rose one tall pine, spreading its head of sparse dark branches, dark against the sky. As Lewis glanced down over the terraces, he saw that the tall pine tree was no longer there. In its place there rose above the ilexes what might have been a greater ilex. There was the blackness of a dense growth of foliage rising like a broad and far-spreading and rounded cloud over the lesser trees. Here, then, was a sight wholly incredible, impossible. It is doubtful whether the process of the human mind in such a case has ever been analyzed and registered. It is doubtful whether it ever can be registered. It is hardly fair to bring in the mathematician, since he deals with absolute truth, so far as mortality can conceive absolute truth. But how would a mathematician feel if he were suddenly confronted with a two-sided triangle? I suppose he would instantly become a raging madman, and Lewis, staring wide-eyed, and wild-eyed at a dark and spreading tree which his own experience informed him was not there, felt for an instant that shock which should affront us all when we first realized the intolerable antinomy of Achilles 
and the tortoise. Common sense tells us that Achilles will flash past the tortoise almost with the speed of the lightning. The inflexible truth of mathematics assures us that till the earth boils and the heavens cease to endure, the tortoise must still be in advance, and thereupon we should, in common decency, go mad. We do not go mad, because by special grace we are certified that, in the final court of appeal, all science is a lie, even the highest science of all. And so we simply grin at Achilles and the tortoise, as we grin at Darwin, deride Huxley, and laugh at Herbert Spencer. Dr. Lewis did not grin. He glared into the dimness of the night at the great spreading tree that he knew could not be there. And as he gazed, he saw that what at first appeared the dense blackness of foliage was fretted and starred with wonderful appearances of lights and colors. Afterwards, he said to me, I remember thinking to myself, look here, I am not delirious. My temperature is perfectly normal. I am not drunk. I only had a pint of graves with my dinner over three hours ago. I have not eaten any poisonous fungus. I have not taken an alonium lueni, experimentally. So now then, what is happening? The night had gloomed over. Clouds obscured the faint moon and the misty stars. Lewis rose, with some kind of warning and inhibiting gesture to Remnant, who, he was conscious, was gaping at him in astonishment. He walked to the open French window, and took a pace forward on to the path outside and looked, very intently, at the dark shape of the tree. Down below the sloping garden, above the washing of the waves, he shaded the light of the lamp behind him by holding his hands on each side of his eyes. The mass of the tree, the tree that couldn't be there, stood out against the sky, but not so clearly now that the clouds had rolled up. Its edges, the limits of its leafage, were not so distinct. Lewis thought that he could detect some sort of quivering movement in it, though the air was at a dead calm. It was a night on which one might hold up a lighted match and watch it burn without any wavering or inclination of the flame. "'You know,' said Lewis, "'how a bit of burnt paper will sometimes hang over the coals before it goes up the chimney, and little worms of fire will shoot through it? It was like that. If you should be standing some distance away, just threads and hairs of yellow light I saw, and specks and sparks of fire, and then a twinkling of a ruby no bigger than a pinpoint, and a green wandering in the black, as if an emerald were crawling, and then little veins of deep blue. Woe is me, I said to myself in Welsh, what is all this color and burning? And then, at that very moment, there came a thundering rap at the door of the room inside, and there was my man telling me that I was wanted directly up at the garth, as old Mr. Trevor Williams had been taken very bad. I knew his heart was not worth much, so I had to go off directly and leave Remnant to make what he could of it all. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Terror, A Mystery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gruzinski. The Terror by Arthur Machen. Chapter 6. Mr. Remnant's Z Ray. Dr. Lewis was kept some time at the Garth. It was past twelve when he got back to his house. He went quickly to the room that overlooked the garden and the sea, and threw open the French window and peered into the darkness. There, dim indeed against the dim sky, but unmistakable, was the tall pine tree, with its sparse branches, high above the dense growth of the ilex trees. The strange boughs which had amazed him had vanished. There was no appearance now of colors or of fires. 
He drew his chair up to the open window and sat there gazing and wondering far into the night till brightness came upon the sea and sky, and the forms of the trees in the garden grew clear and evident. He went up to his bed at last filled with a great perplexity, still asking questions to which there was no answer. The doctor did not say anything about the strange tree to Remnant. When they next met, Lewis said that he had thought there was a man hiding amongst the bushes. This, in explanation of that warning gesture he had used, and of his going out into the garden and staring into the night. He concealed the truth, because he dreaded the remnant doctrine that would undoubtedly be produced. Indeed, he hoped that he had heard the last of the theory of the Z-ray. But Remnant firmly reopened this subject. "'We were interrupted just as I was putting my case to you,' he said. "'And to sum it all up, it amounts to this, "'that the Huns have made one of the great leaps of science. "'They are sending suggestions, which amount to irresistible commands, over here. "'And the persons affected are seized with suicidal or homicidal mania. "'The people who were killed by falling over the cliffs or into the quarry "'probably committed suicide.' And so with the man and the boy who were found in the bog. As to the highway case, you remember that Thomas Evans said that he stopped and talked to Williams on the night of the murder. In my opinion, Evans was the murderer. He came under the influence of the ray, became a homicidal maniac in an instant, snatched Williams' spade from his hand, and killed him and the others. The bodies were found by me on the road. It is possible that the first impact of the ray produces violent nervous excitement, which would manifest itself externally. Williams might have called to his wife to come and see what was the matter with Evans. The children would naturally follow their mother. It seems to me simple. And as for the animals, the horses, dogs, and so forth, they, as I say, were no doubt panic-stricken by the ray, and hence driven to frenzy. Why should Evans have murdered Williams instead of Williams murdering Evans? Why should the impact of the ray affect one and not the other? Why does one man react violently to a certain drug while it makes no impression on another man? Why is A able to drink a bottle of whiskey and remain sober, while B is turned into something very like a lunatic after he has drunk three glasses? It is a question of idiosyncrasy, said the doctor. Is idiosyncrasy Greek for, I don't know, asked Remnant. Not at all, said Lewis, smiling blandly. I mean that in some diatheses, whiskey, as you have mentioned whiskey, appears not to be pathogenic, or at all events not immediately pathogenic. In other cases, as you very justly observed, there seems to be a very marked cachexia associated with the exhibition of the spirit in question, even in comparatively small doses. Under this cloud of professional verbiage, Lewis escaped from the club and from Remnant. He did not want to hear any more about that dreadful ray, because he felt sure that the ray was all nonsense. But asking himself, why he felt this certitude in the matter he had to confess that he didn't know. An aeroplane, he reflected, was all nonsense before it was made. And he remembered talking in the early 90s to a friend of his about the newly discovered X-rays. The friend laughed incredulously, evidently didn't believe a word of it, till Lewis told him that there was an article on the subject in the current number of the Saturday Review. Whereupon the unbeliever said, Oh, is that so? Oh, really? I see. And was converted on the X-ray faith on the spot. Lewis, remembering this talk, marveled at the strange processes of the human mind, its illogical and yet all-compelling ergos, and wondered whether he himself was only waiting for an article on the Z-Ray in the Saturday Review to become a devout believer in the doctrine of Remnant. But he wondered with far more fervor as to the extraordinary thing he had seen in his own garden with his own eyes, the tree that changed all its shape for an hour or two of the night, 
the growth of strange boughs, the apparition of secret fires among them, the sparkling of emerald and ruby lights. How could one fail to be afraid, with great amazement, at the thought of such a mystery? Dr. Lewis's thoughts were distracted from the incredible adventure of the tree by the visit of his sister and her husband. Mr. and Mrs. Merritt lived in a well-known manufacturing town of the Midlands, which was now, of course, a center of munition work. On the day of their arrival at Porth, Mrs. Merritt, who was tired after the long, hot journey, went to bed early, and Merritt and Lewis went into the room by the garden for their talk and tobacco. They spoke of the year that had passed since their last meeting, of the weary dragging of the war, of friends that had perished in it, of the hopelessness of an early ending of all this misery. Lewis said nothing of the terror that was on the land. One does not greet a tired man who has come to a quiet, sunny place for relief from black smoke and work and worry with a tale of horror. Indeed, the doctor saw that his brother-in-law looked far from well, and he seemed jumpy. There was an occasional twitch of his mouth that Lewis did not like at all. Well, said the doctor, after an interval of silence in port wine, I am glad to see you here again. Porth always suits you. I don't think you're looking quite up to your usual form, but three weeks of Marian air will do wonders. Well, I hope it will, said the other. I'm not up to the mark. Things are not going well at Middlingham. Business is all right, isn't it? Yes, business is all right, but there are other things that are all wrong. We are living under a reign of terror, it comes to that. What on earth do you mean? Well, I suppose I may tell you what I know. It's not much. I didn't dare write it. But do you know that at every one of the munition works in Middlingham, and all about it, there's a guard of soldiers with drawn bayonets and loaded rifles day and night? Men with bombs, too, and machine guns at the big factories. German spies? You don't want Lewis guns to fight spies with, nor bombs, nor a platoon of men. I woke up last night. It was the machine gun at Bennington's Army Motor Works, firing like fury, and then bang, bang, bang. That was the hand bombs. But what against? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what is happening, Merritt repeated, and he went on to describe the bewilderment and terror that hung like a cloud over the great industrial city in the Midlands. How the feeling of concealment, of some intolerable secret danger that must not be named, was worse of all. A young fellow I know, he said, was on short leave the other day from the front, and he spent it with his people at Belmont. That's about four miles out of Middlingham, you know. Thank God, he said to me, I'm going back tomorrow. It's no good saying that the wiper's salient is nice, because it isn't. But it's a damned sight better than this. At the front, you know what you're up against, anyhow. At Middlingham, everybody has the feeling that we're up against something awful, and we don't know what. It's that that makes people inclined to whisper. There's terror in the air. Merritt made a sort of picture of the great town cowering in its fear of an unknown danger. People are afraid to go out about alone at nights in the outskirts. They make up parties at the stations to go home together if it's anything like dark, or if there are any lonely bits on their way. But why? I don't understand. What are they afraid of? Well... I told you about my being awakened up the other night with the machine guns at the motor works rattling away and the bombs exploding and making the most terrible noise. That sort of thing alarms one, you know. It's only natural. Indeed, it must be very terrifying. You mean, then, there is a general nervousness about, a vague sort of apprehension that makes people inclined to herd together? There's that, and there's more. People have gone out that have never come back. There were a couple of men in the train to home, arguing about the quickest way to get to North End. 
a sort of outlying part of home where they both lived. They argued all the way out of Midlingham, one saying that the high road was the quickest, though it was the longest way. It's the quickest going because it's the cleanest going, he said. And the other chap fancied a shortcut across the fields by the canal. It's half the distance, he kept on. Yes, if you don't lose your way, said the other. Well, it appears they put an even half crown on it, and each was to try his own way when they got out of the train. It was arranged that they were to meet at the wagon in North End. I shall be at the wagon first, said the man, who believed in the shortcut. And with that he climbed over the stile and made off across the fields. It wasn't late enough to be really dark, and a lot of them thought he might win the stakes. But he never turned up at the wagon, or anywhere else for the matter of that. What happened to him? He was found lying on his back in the middle of a field, some way from the path. He was dead. The doctors said he'd been suffocated. Nobody knows how. Then there have been other cases. We whisper about them at Midlingham, but we're afraid to speak out. Lewis was ruminating all this profoundly. Terror in Marion and terror far away in the heart of England. But at Midlingham, so far as he could gather from these stories of soldiers on guard, of crackling machine guns, it was a case of an organized attack on the munitioning of the army. He felt that he did not know enough to warrant his deciding that the terror of Marion and of Stratfordshire were one. Then Merritt began again. There's a queer story going about, when the door is shut, the curtains drawn, that is, as to a place right out in the country over the other side of Midlingham, on the opposite side to Dunwich. They've built one of the new factories out there, a great red brick town of sheds, they tell me it is, with a tremendous chimney. It's not been finished more than a month or six weeks. They plumped it down right in the middle of the fields by the line, and they're building huts for the workers as fast as they can, but up to the present the men are billeted all about up and down the line. About two hundred yards from this place there's an old footpath leading from the station and the main road up to the small hamlet on the hillside. Part of the way this path goes by a pretty large wood, most of it thick undergrowth. I should think there must be twenty acres of wood, more or less. As it happens, I used this path once long ago, and I can tell you it's a black place of nights. A man had to go this way one night. He got along all right till he came to the wood, and then he said his heart dropped out of his body. It was awful to hear the noises in that wood. Thousands of men were in it, he swears that. It was full of rustling and pattering of feet, trying to go dainty, and the crack of dead boughs lying on the ground as someone trod on them, and swishing of the grass, and some sort of chattering speech going on that sounded, so he said, as if the dead sat in their bones and talked. He ran for his life anyhow across the fields, over hedges, through brooks. He must have run by his tail ten miles out of his way before he got home to his wife, and beat at the door and broke in and bolted it behind him. There is something rather alarming about any wood at night, said Dr. Lewis. Merritt shrugged his shoulders. People say that the Germans have landed, and that they are hiding in underground places all over the country. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Terror: A Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lilith Brander. The Terror by Arthur Machen. Chapter Seven: The Case of the Hidden Germans. Lewis gasped for a moment, silent in contemplation of the magnificence of rumor. The Germans already landed, hiding underground, striking by night, secretly, terribly, at the power of England. Here was a conception which made the myth of the Russians a paltry fable, before which the legend of Mons was an ineffectual thing. 
It was monstrous. And yet, he looked steadily at Merritt, a square-headed, black-haired, solid sort of man. He had symptoms of nerves about him for the moment, certainly, but one could not wonder at that, whether the tales he told were true, or whether he merely believed them to be true. Lewis had known his brother-in-law for twenty years or more, and had always found him a sure man in his own small world. But then, said the doctor to himself, those men, if they once get out of the ring of that little world of theirs, they are lost. Those are the men that believed in Madame Blavatsky. Well, he said, what do you think yourself? The Germans landed and hiding somewhere about the country. There's something extravagant in the notion, isn't there? I don't know what to think. You can't get over the facts. There are the soldiers with their rifles and the guns at the works all over Staffordshire, and those guns go off. I told you I'd hurt them. Then who are the soldiers shooting at? That's what we ask ourselves at Middlingham. Quite so, I quite understand. It's an extraordinary state of things. It's more than extraordinary. It's an awful state of things. It's terror in the dark. And there's nothing worse than that. As that young fellow I was telling you about said, at the front you do know what you're up against. And people really believe that a number of Germans have somehow got over to England and have hid themselves underground? People say they've got a new kind of poison gas, something that they dig underground places and make the gas there, and lead it by secret pipes into the shops. Others say that they throw gas bombs into the factories. It must be worse than anything they've used in France, from what the authorities say. The authorities? Do they admit that there are Germans in hiding about Midlandham? No, they call it explosions, but we know it isn't explosions. We know in the Midlands what an explosion sounds like and looks like, and we know that the people killed in these explosions are put into the coffins in the works. Their own relations are not allowed to see them. And so you believe in the German theory? If I do, it's because one must believe in something. Some say they've seen the gas. I heard that a man living in Dunwich saw it one night like a black cloud with sparks of fire in it floating over the tops of the trees by Dunwich Common. The light of an ineffable amazement came into Lewis's eyes. The night of Remnant's visit, the trembling vibration of the air, the dark tree that had grown in his garden since the setting of the sun, the strange leafage that was starred with burning with emerald and ruby fires and all vanished away when he returned from his visit to the garth and such a leafage had appeared as a burning cloud far in the heart of england what intolerable mystery what tremendous doom was signified in this but one thing was clear and certain that the terror of marion was also the terror of the midlands lewis made up his mind most firmly that if possible all this should be kept from his brother-in-law. Marriage had come to Porth as to a city refuge from the horrors of Midlingham. If it could be managed, it should be spared the knowledge that the cloud of terror had gone before him and hung black over the western land. Lewis passed the port and sat in an even voice. Very strange, indeed. A black cloud with sparks of fire? I can't answer for it, you know, it's only a rumour. Just so, and you think, or you are inclined to think that these and all the rest you've told me is to be put down to the hidden Germans? As I say, because one must think something. I quite see your point. No doubt, if it's true, it's the most awful blow that has ever been dwelled at any nation in the whole history of man. The enemy established now vitals. But is it possible, after all? How could it have been worked? Merritt told Lewis how it had been worked, or rather, how people said it had been worked. The idea, he said, was that there was a part, and a most important part, of the great German plot to destroy England and the British Empire. The scheme had been prepared years ago, some thought soon after the Franco-Prussian War. Moltke had seen that the invasion of England, in the ordinary sense of the term invasion, presented very great difficulties. The matter was constantly in discussion in the inner military and high political circles, 
and the general trend of opinion in these quarters was that at the best the invasion of england would involve germany in the gravest difficulties and leave france in the position of the tertius galdens this was the state of affairs when a very high prussian personage was approached by the swedish professor uvelius thus merit and here i would say in parenthesis that this uvelius was by all accounts an extraordinary man considered personally and apart from his writings he would appear to have been a most amiable individual he was richer than the generality of swedes certainly far richer than the average university professor in sweden but his shabby green frock coat and his spattered furry hat was notorious in the university town where he lived no one laughed because it was well known that professor huvelius spent every penny of his private means and a large portion of his official stipend on works of kindness and charity he hid his hat in a garret someone said in order that others might be able to swell on the first floor it was told of him that he restricted himself to a diet of dry bread and coffee for a month in order that the poor woman of the streets dying of consumption might enjoy luxuries in hospital and this was the man who wrote a treatise de facinore humano to prove the infinite corruption of the human race oddly enough professor huvelius wrote the most cynical book in the world hobbes preaches rosy sentimentalism in comparison with the very highest motives he held that a very large part of human misery misadventure and sorrow was due to the false convention that the heart of man was naturally and in the main well disposed and kindly if not exactly righteous murderers thieves assassins violators and all the host of the abominable he says in one passage are created by the false pretence and foolish credence of human virtue a lion in a cage is a fierce beast indeed but what will he be if we declare him to be a lamb and open the doors of his den who will be guilty of the death of the men women and children whom he will surely devour save those who unlocked the cage and he goes on to show that kings and the rulers of the peoples could decrease the sum of human misery to a vast extent by acting on the doctrine of human wickedness war he declares which is one of the worst of evils will always continue to exist but a wise king will decide a brief war rather than a lengthy one a short evil rather than a long evil and this not from the benignity of his heart towards his enemies for we have seen that the human heart is naturally malignant but because he desires to conquer and to conquer easily without a great expenditure of men or of treasure knowing that if he can accomplish this feat his people will love him and his crown will be secure so he will wage brief victorious wars and not only spare his own nation but the nation of the enemy since in a short war the loss is less on both sides than in a long war and so from evil will come good and how ask huvelius as such wars to be waged the wise prince he replies will begin by assuming the enemy to be infinitely corruptible and infinitely stupid since stupidity and corruption are the chief characteristics of man so the prince will make himself friends in the very councils of his enemy and also amongst the populace bribing the wealthy by proffering them the opportunity of still greater wealth and winning the poor by swelling words for contrary to the common opinion it is the wealthy who are greedy of wealth while the populace are to be gained by talking to them about liberty the unknown god and so much are they enchanted by the words liberty freedom and such like that the wise can go to the poor rob them of what little they have dismiss them with a hearty kick and win their hearts and their votes for ever if only they will assure them that the treatment which they have received is called liberty guided by these principles says huvelius the wise prince will entrench himself in the country that he desires to conquer nay with but little trouble he may actually have literally throw his garrisons into the heart of the enemy country before war has begun this is a long and tiresome parenthesis but it is necessary as explaining the long tale which merritt told his brother-in-law 
he having received it from some magnate of the midlands who had travelled in germany it is probable that the story was suggested in the first place by the passage from Huvelius which I have just quoted. Merritt knew nothing of the real Huvelius. He was all but a saint. He thought of the Swedish professor as a monster of iniquity, worse, as he said, than Nietzsche, meaning, no doubt, Nietzsche. So he told the story of how Huvelius had sold his plan to the Germans, a plan for filling England with German soldiers. Land was to be bought in certain suitable and well-considered places. Englishmen were to be bought as the apparent owners of such land, and secret excavations were to be made till the country was literally undermined. A subterranean Germany, in fact, was to be dug under selected districts of England. There were to be great caverns, underground cities, well-drained, well-ventilated, supplied with water, and in these places vast stores both of food and of munitions were to be accumulated, year after year, till the day dawned, and then, warned in time, the secret garrison would leave shops, hotels, offices, villas, and vanish underground, ready to begin their work of bleeding England at the heart. That's what Hansen told me, said Merritt at the end of his long story. Henson, head of the Buckley Iron and Steel Syndicate, he has been a lot in Germany. Well, said Louis, of course it may be so. If it is so, it is terrible beyond words. Indeed, he found something horribly plausible in the story. It was an extraordinary plan, of course, an unheard of scheme, but it did not seem impossible. It was the Trojan horse on a gigantic scale. Indeed, he reflected. The story of the horse with the warriors concealed within it, which was dragged into the heart of Troy by the deluded Trojans themselves, might be taken as the prophetic parable of what had happened to England, if Henson's theory were well founded. And this theory certainly squared with what one had heard of German preparations in Belgium and in France, and placements for guns ready for the invader, German manufacturers which were really German forts on Belgian soil, the caverns by the Aden, made ready for the cannon. Indeed, Lewis thought he remembered something about suspicious concrete tennis courts on the heights commanding London. But the German army hidden under English ground, it was a thought to chill the stoutest heart. And it seemed from that wonder of the burning tree that the enemy mysteriously and terribly present at Mickleham was present also in Marion. Lewis, thinking of the country as he knew it, of his wild and desolate hillsides, his deep woods, his wastes and solitary places, could not be confessed that no more fit region could be found for the deadly enterprise of secret men. Yet, he thought again, there was but little harm to be done in Marion to the armies of England or to their munitionment. They were working for panic terror. Possibly that might be so, but the camp under the highway? That should be their first project, and no harm had been done there. Lewis did not know that since the panic of the horses, men had died terribly in that camp, that it was now a fortified place, with a deep, broad trench, a thick tangle of savage barbed wire about it, and a machine-gun planted at each corner. End of chapter 7